In fact, one of the earliest uh, deities of Indian art is uh, Indra, who is seen in the uh, BC period uh, caves of uh, Bhaja in Maharashtra. And Indra is also a bearer of the thunderbolt. The Bodhisattva Padmapani, whereas the Vajrapani brought before us the majesty of the spirit, the Padmapani brings before us the peace of the spirit within us. This is uh, Parvati as uh, Shivakami, dance of Shiva, the cosmic dance of Shiva cannot be without Parvati as the witness, as the eternal witness. And when she is there as the witness, she is known as Shivakami. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. A great pleasure to be here at uh, a Srijan talk to share with you some beautiful aspects of the art of India. 27 years ago, I had the privilege of photographing the paintings of Ajanta, the 2nd century to 5th century, 6th century paintings of Ajanta, which are known to be the fountainhead of the classic tradition of uh, painting in Asia, which are known to be the fountainhead of uh, Buddhist paintings in the world. When I photographed these, uh, I was uh, invited by the major museums and universities around the world, whether it was the British Museum, whether it was the uh, Philadelphia Museum of Art, the Metropolitan Museum, the Tokyo National University of Fine Arts and Music and so many others uh, suddenly all invited me to come and speak on this subject and to show the paintings of Ajanta. And you would be very happy to know that there was a unanimous response to the paintings of Ajanta whether it was in London, Paris, New York and everywhere else, the art historians and art critics were unanimous in saying that this must surely be the finest art of humankind. And the finest art not just for paintings of as way back as the 5th century, but the finest art including all the art of the Renaissance, of the Impressionistic, the Expressionistic periods, coming even up to modern art. It was not only the technical virtuosity of this art which amazed people in all these capitals of art of the world. For indeed there was immense technical virtuosity. The paintings had so much in them which the rest of the art, the art of the late Renaissance and much later uh, acquired. So paintings did have technical virtuosity which was amazing but more than that there was a vision of life which these paintings contained which made these uniquely beautiful and so important in the art of the world. It is a vision of life which is the same that is in you and in me, in all the animals, the birds, the insects, the flowers, the leaves, all that there is around us. It sees a great unity in the whole of creation. And obviously, this imparted a great sense of compassion to every line which the painter made. However, it was when I later, <coughs> in 1992, when I photographed the previously unphotographed uh, 10th century paintings of the Brahadishwara temple in a ambulatory in Tanjavur, it is then 
that art historians all over the world said that they had to revise their understanding of the history of Indian art. And when I asked why this was so, it was explained to me that they had been aware of the paintings of Ajanta, but because paintings before Ajanta were not well known, and because paintings for the next 800 years after Ajanta were not well known, Ajanta was always treated like a flash in the pan. It was not understood and seen to be as a part of a tradition of painting. But when now they were seeing paintings of the 10th century, which carried forward the marvelous technical virtuosity of the 5th century Ajanta paintings, they felt sure that yes, indeed, there must be a continuous tradition of painting coming from ancient times in India. I had the good fortune thereafter to go on to photograph other paintings of the 5th century, the 6th century, 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th centuries, and thereby establishing a continuous tradition of this marvelous art. Now the philosophy of aesthetics was very highly developed in a very ancient uh, period in this subcontinent. In this it is understood that the feelings that you experience when you look upon something truly beautiful, as in nature, like when you are seeing a beautiful sunrise, or in art, when you may be seeing a painting of Ajanta, this moment of this experience of beauty is understood in this philosophy to be akin to Brahmanand itself, the ecstasy of salvation itself. For in that moment, the veils of the illusion of the material world, Maya or Mithya, are believed to be lifted and you are seeing the grace which underlies all that there is. Therefore, art has always played a fundamental and very important role in the philosophic life of India. Now, when you look upon these uh, paintings, when you look upon these deities, it is important for you to remember that there are no gods in the ancient philosophic tradition of India coming from the Upanishads. There are deities and these deities are the personification of the qualities within you. The wisdom, the compassion, the grace, all these qualities within you, the energy within you with which you would combat the demons of your ignorance, all these qualities are personified in these marvelous deities. When you look upon these deities, when you meditate upon these deities, when you respond to the grace and beauty of these deities, you awaken those qualities within yourself. When these qualities are awakened, and if these qualities continue to grow within you, then one day it is hoped that these qualities will fill you completely. And in that moment, you have become the deity. So such is a noble and beautiful and important role that art had to play in ancient India. Uh, this is an enchanted place. This is the gorge of the Vaghora River in Maharashtra, in Western India, where 31 caves were excavated out of the living hill in two phases. One phase around the 2nd century BC and the second around the 5th century AD. And uh, these caves were, the walls and ceilings of these caves were exquisitely painted. Um, the caves are dark inside 
and uh, strong lights are not allowed to be used. Now, whatever lights that were allowed to be used used to be running through a dimmer coming at uh, low voltage and therefore casting only an orangish light like this upon the paintings. So despite the enormous amount, uh, importance of these paintings which was recognized, this is how the paintings were seen and this is how the paintings were known to be. Now, fortunately, I had, um, uh, I developed a tradition of photographing in extremely low light uh, akin to darkness in which I was able to uh, capture the true colors of the paintings. So here you see the colors of the same painting which uh, you had just seen. Because of the orangish light, these greens and blues in particular had been lost, which were able to come out and you were able to see the details of the paintings standing out in this low light. This is uh, in uh, Cave 1. It is a painting of uh, about the 5th century. It is uh, a princely figure who bears an offering of lotuses for the Vajrapani that you see here. And this is the Bodhisattva Vajrapani. Bodhisattva, as you would know, is a being who is on his way to salvation. Vajrapani means bearer of the thunderbolt. The thunderbolt is one of the favorite images in Indian philosophy and Indian art from the earliest period. In fact, one of the earliest deities of Indian art is uh, Indra, who is seen in the BC period uh, caves of uh, Bhaja in Maharashtra. And Indra is also a bearer of the thunderbolt. The latest form of Buddhism which is practiced in the world today is also known as the Vajrayana, the vehicle of the thunderbolt. Its logic is supposed to be as striking as a thunderbolt. Now this Bodhisattva with his uh, glorious uh, crown brings before you the majesty of the spirit within us. It is always this spirit within us which is the focus of this philosophy and is therefore the focus of this art. Again in Cave uh, 1, uh, the Bodhisattva Padmapani, whereas the Vajrapani brought before us the majesty of the spirit, the Padmapani brings before us the peace of the spirit within us. Padmapani means the bearer of the lotus. Um, to your left, uh, over his right shoulder, you would see the uh, kinner, that heavenly musician, part human, part bird, who plays a musical instrument. To your right, over his left shoulder, you would see the monkeys playing and above that, geese. Yet, with all this activity around him, you would see that he looks within. It is this life within which is the focus of the paintings of Ajanta. It is this marvelous sense of stillness which you see upon this face, which is the result of looking within, of leaving behind the noise and clamor of the material world around us to focus upon the peace that can be found within. To the left of the painting of the Padmapani, a couple in harmony. Indeed, this is a sense of harmony which pervades the world of Ajanta. And I say world because there are thousands of figures still surviving, painted upon the walls of Ajanta. And all of them are filled with this deep sense of harmony of the world of creation. 
you would notice the gradual lightening and deepening of color which persuades your eye of the roundedness of form. This rendering of form, though it is uh, very early to see it in a 5th century painting, the paintings of Ajanta are well known for this rendering and it is in fact a part of the tradition of art which is seen emanating from Ajanta and is seen to travel across the Asian subcontinent, across the Asian continent, I'm sorry. On the left wall of cave one, the Mahajanak Jatak. Jataks, as you would know, are the stories of uh, Lord Buddha in his uh, previous birth, in the form of different human beings and in the form of different animals. Here, you see King uh, Mahajanak uh, listening to the sermon of this hermit. Now, you might notice that the antelope painted below listen with as much rapt attention to the hermit as do any of the human figures. For in the vision of life of these painters, in the vision of these painters, the animals are no different from the human figures. They are just like you and me. I will take you to a closer view of Mahajanak. Mahajanak was a glorious king, a powerful king, who had in fact won back the lands earlier lost by his father. But you would see here the way that he sits upon the ground, looking up, with a look of adoration upon his face, which even the damage of so many centuries has not managed to remove. He looks up at this hermit who is giving a sermon, his hands in front of him. It is this sense of humility with which we rise. It is this sense of humility which is the message of this great art. Having decided, uh, having heard the uh, sermon of this hermit, King Mahajanak decides to renounce his palace life and to go away into the forest as an ascetic. We see him here in his palace announcing this decision and behind him is his mother. In front of him is his wife, Queen Shivali. The Queen Shivali's eyes are painted in a very particular way. By the time these paintings were made, the earliest known treaties on art making had been penned out of earlier ongoing traditions. This is called the Chitra Sutra. The Chitra Sutra provides thousands of guidelines to the painter on how to make different kinds of uh, human figures with different emotions, how to make landscapes, how to make animals and birds and plants and flowers, uh, how, uh, five different ways to carry out shading and so much more. And among these details, it provides five different shapes in which eyes can be made to convey different expressions. Now, Queen Shivali's eyes made here are made exactly in the way, in the shape, which is for the eyes of a person who may be sad or weeping, as indeed she may be, for she is hearing that her husband is going to be leaving her and going away into the forest. Her lower garment is woven in the form of ikkat, which is practiced till today in India. Her upper garment, for there is an upper garment, and uh, at her hip you see some design on it. Her upper garment is practically transparent. And it reminds you of the fact that India was in ancient times very well known for the very fine and practically transparent uh, textiles which were made here. In fact, the whole of the Deccan from Maharashtra in the western side 
to Andhra Pradesh on the eastern side was a very ancient cotton growing area and beautiful textiles were known to be woven in this whole region, a tradition which carries on till today. There was much trade of these textiles. In fact, uh, Pliny the Elder writes in Rome in the first century that uh, Roman coffers are being emptied for buying too many fine textiles from India. A century later, Emperor Vesuvian is still uh, voicing the same uh, sentiment. In fact, there were these um, large colonies of Romans who uh, were settled in, uh, in the Deccan in Andhra Pradesh, close to early uh, Buddhist uh, sites which have been found there. In fact, even before that, in the BC period, there were uh, many uh, Greeks who were settled in uh, Maharashtra, some of whom uh, donated uh, uh, pillars and other sculptures uh, in the Buddhist uh, caves of uh, Maharashtra. Now you might like to notice uh, the strings of pearls which dangle below her bosom. And you might notice the curve of these burst of these uh, pearl strings, a curve which convinces your eyes of their movement. Now, such are the kind of details which are mentioned in the fifth century treatise on painting, the Chitra Sutra. The Chitra Sutra expects the artist of that time to be able to make the movement of uh, the breeze in an unmoving uh, medium of painting, to be able to convey the movement of waves in painting. Such is the high quality of art which is expected uh, uh, in this time. Behind the queen, three palace maids responding in sadness and in shock to this news that the king is going to leave their mistress, the queen, alone as he will go into the forest. You see the shock clearly written upon the face below. You see the sadness upon the faces, the two faces above. Indeed, everywhere in the paintings of Ajanta, you see figures that are concerned about what happens to others. It is this deep concern this adoration, this concern, this sympathy which fills this marvellous world. Having taken that decision to renounce his worldly life, here you see Mahajanak riding out of the palace, leaving his uh, kingly life behind him. You would notice the inward look has already come into his eyes as he leaves the worldly concerns behind. And you notice the deep sense of peace which has come upon him. Cave 17 of Ajanta, the Vishvantara Jatak. Prince Vishvantar is the last birth of the Bodhisattva before he will be born as uh, Gautama Siddhartha who will gain enlightenment to become a Buddha. Now here you see <coughs> Prince Vishwantar also announcing the decision that he is going to give up his palace life and go away into the forest. And uh, he is saying this, he is telling this to his wife, Princess Madri. In fact, he suggests to her that she should stay back in the palace as she would not be used to the difficult life outside. She, however, decides to go with him. You might like to notice uh, the purse which she dangles in her hand. And you might notice the curve of the purse strings from which you know that she is swinging that purse. There are other marvellous uh, details in the painting you would notice the perspective of the receding uh, pillars. You would notice the elliptical mouth 
of the vessel which uh, this man is uh, carrying and so many other beautiful details of this 5th century painting. The Mahisha Jatak in Cave 17 of Ajanta. The story of the Buddha born previously as a Mahisha, a buffalo. This pesky monkey is troubling the Mahisha, but the kindly Bodhisattva does not mind. In fact, I am sure you can see the smile on the face of the Mahisha. And you can be sure it was intended to be there. Because in the eyes of this artist, the Mahisha is just like any of us. As a matter of fact, I am sure that finer and better character is painted and sculpted in the Bodhisattvas even more than in the human beings. Something that the world needs to learn again from the ancient vision of India and from this art of that period. Uh, another painting from uh, Cave 17 of Ajanta. This is from the Shaddanta Jatak in which uh, large elephants were also made. Now I show you this to show you how indeed the artist had the whole of creation in his mind. If you look at the branch of the tree close to the head of this man, I'll take you to a closer view. And those are ants climbing up that tree. For indeed, even though the ants are not very visible, even when you go to uh, the cave, they are very much a part of the living world and very much a part of the concerns of this artist who has the whole world in his vision. Again, uh, paintings of the 5th century, but uh, scarcely seen paintings of the 5th century. The Buddhist caves of Pital Khoda, about uh, an hour's drive away from uh, Elora, not very far from uh, Aurangabad. And even as I say Buddhist caves, it's uh, important to point out that uh, in Indian art of the ancient period, uh, all the, the artists were the same. It was the same artists who painted the Buddhist, Jaina, Hindu and other uh, uh, caves and uh, temples. As a matter of fact, um, it was in the rule of the same kings that uh, caves and temples were patronized of the different faiths. As a matter of fact, the entire range of all the Buddhist uh, art of ancient India was produced during the rule of kings who were worshipping Hindu deities. So that is the kind of marvellous uh, uh, traditions that we had in ancient India. Inscriptions of ancient India go to show that every single family that we know about from ancient India had in it somebody who was worshipping Shiva or Vishnu, Hindu deities, somebody who was worshipping the Buddha or somebody who was worshipping Mahavira. So uh, the division of religions between Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism are things which was created under colonial rule. In ancient India, it was all the same philosophic path. Again, Buddhist caves uh, of the 5th century. This is uh, Bagh in uh, Madhya Pradesh, in present-day Madhya Pradesh. Uh, but it is not very far from uh, the region of uh, the caves of uh, Maharashtra. And this was on a trade route which connected Nalla Supara, which was the great port of ancient times where Mumbai is located today. So this trade route connected uh, Nalla Supara going uh, northeast up to uh, Ujjain and Vidisha in uh, Madhya Pradesh in central India. And uh, the caves of Bagh fell on this uh, trade route. 
marvelous paintings of the 5th century. Uh, you would notice the foreshortening of the bull, which uh, you may not expect in a 5th century painting. You would notice the marvelous uh, graphic quality of the art, which uh, looks more like uh, modern art rather than uh, ancient uh, painting. The earliest uh, surviving paintings of the Hindu tradition are here in uh, Badami in uh, Karnataka. Again, there is a great deal of uh, damage, but enough survives to show you the gentleness and that inward look, which is really the theme of this beautiful ancient art. We move into the beginning of the uh, medieval tradition in Indian art. And this is the uh, 8th, 9th century. It is a ceiling painting from uh, a Jain cave in uh, Elora. The uh, art is now uh, much more abstracted and much more linear. There is a more graphic uh, quality about it. And if you look closely, you might notice the uh, protruding uh, uh, further eye beyond the line of the face. Now this is something which has been uh, well known from uh, Jain uh, miniature paintings and has been considered a feature peculiar to the Jain uh, miniature paintings. However, when you look at uh, mural paintings in India, you find that this is a feature of all the medieval paintings. You find it in Ladakh. You also find it, in fact, in uh, other countries which were following the Indian tradition, such as uh, Myanmar. You see it in the uh, paintings of Bagan of the 12th century. Shiva. This is uh, the 7th century it is the marvelous uh, Kailash Natha temple of Kanchipuram. A glorious uh, sense of uh, regal grandeur which begins to come into the art under the rule of the Pallavas. Again, uh, 7th century, a painting which has uh, very been seen by very, very few people. Uh, this is... Uh, in the Tala Girishwara temple in a remote village called Pannamalai in Tamil Nadu of the 7th century. This is uh, Parvati as uh, Shivakami. Uh, the uh, dance of Shiva, the cosmic dance of Shiva cannot be without Parvati as the witness, as the eternal witness. And when she is there as the witness, she is known as Shiva Kami, as you see her here. The tenderness with which she looks upon Shiva makes this one of the masterpieces of Indian art. Ninth century, this is again in a very remote part of uh, Tamil Nadu called Sittanavasal. A marvelous place, a beautiful place. In fact, one of the things to note about uh, sites of Indian art of the early periods is the natural beauty of the sites. The persons who made these or selected these sites had the natural beauty as much in mind as the beauty of the art. Till the last time I went here, it was a very remote place and there were many peacocks uh, all over. This is a scene of uh, the faithful gathering uh, lotuses to put on uh, the resting place of a Jain uh, Tirthankar. And there is a gentleness to this art which makes it uh, unique. We move on to the end of the 10th century. This is the great uh, Brahadishwara temple at Tanjavur. If you live, look to the left of the tower of the temple, there is a metal stairway which takes one up and uh, you enter a corridor, an ambulatory, which goes around the Garbhagrihe of the temple. 
Now this uh, inner ambulatory uh, has walls which have only five and a half feet of space in between them and paintings on the walls on both sides which go up uh, to the ceiling up to 20 feet which um, hardly gives you enough uh, distance to step back and see the paintings and increases the sense of awe and grandeur as you look upon this art. And indeed, uh, a sense of awe and grandeur is, uh, was intended in this art. For this great uh, temple was made by King Raja Raja Chola to convey his own power and military might as much as the grandeur of the great Lord Shiva, Brahadishvara. And uh, this is uh, Sundarar, a Shaivite saint, uh, seen uh, on Eravat, the elephant of uh, Indra, going up to Mount Kailash, the abode of Lord Shiva. And this is the uh, earliest surviving painting of Lord Shiva as the Nataraja in his uh, cosmic dance. He is seen here dancing below the canopy, the golden canopy of the Chidambaram temple which had already been completed. The smile on his face is very beautiful. Again a detail from the 10th century paintings of the inner ambulatory of the Brahadishvara temple. Indeed, the technical virtuosity of the art is immense. You see the uh, hand poised to strike that little drum. And you would notice uh, the straps of the little drum which convey the uh, movement in the painting. The painter has his medium very much under control and he is able to convey exactly what he wishes to. Now, King Raja Raja Chola with his Guru, Guru Karu Vurar, this is the earliest surviving uh, portrait in uh, Indian painting and this is of the end of the 10th century. Now one of the most marvelous things about uh, Indian art is that for a thousand and five hundred years this art showed, brought before you uh, thousands of uh, figures Deities were created, animals were created, beautiful flowers, fruits and trees were created and the common man was made. But portraits were never made, not even of the king under whose rule the art was being created. For the purpose of the art was to transport us and to take us far from the realm of the ego, to take us away from human concerns and away from any sense of one's own importance and therefore a portrait was completely unnecessary and against the purpose of the art. The Chitra Sutra is also very clear that art is far too important uh, for the making of any individual person. It should convey only the eternal values and eternal themes. But as I say this, it should be noted that there is an exception uh, in the period of the Kushanas, the Kushana rulers who came from uh, Central Asia. Uh, in the first century, they had portraits made of themselves in their temples. But after their rule, the Indian tradition immediately reverted back to itself. And the first portraits that you get to see are actually in sculpture of the 7th, 8th century and they are to be seen at Mamalapuram. And as I said before, in painting, this of the end of the 10th century is the earliest surviving portrait. So it is King Raja Raja Chola and his Guru, Guru Karuvarar. It's also very interesting to see that though the king is uh, breaking tradition to have himself presented in the art, he is doing so with hesitation and he is doing, uh, you know, standing behind, standing in the shelter of his Guru. This continues right up to the 13th century in uh, various sites, in various temples 
in the country some portraits of the king begin to appear but usually they are made very small or they are made with the king uh, praying before a shivalinga or they are made with the king uh, kneeling before uh, his uh, guru so the uh, uh, king has started to present himself in the art but he does so still with a sense of humility which over the years you will see will change and gradually kings will show themselves with great pomposity and a great sense of uh, self importance but this is indeed one of the greatest uh, uh one of the greatest things in the indian tradition of art about the 11th century uh, this is uh, the uh, monastic complex of alchi alchi is uh, known to be one of the 108 uh, monastic centers uh, it is a legendary number but likely to also have been true um, 108 monasteries a chain of monasteries which were the early monasteries of the trans himalayan region these were made in the rule of king uh, yeshe o of goge which consisted of uh, western tibet ladakh lahol spiti and kinnor and all these marvelous uh, monastic temples were painted and sculpted by artists who were invited from kashmir which was one of the great uh, buddhist centers of that time and the art which is found inside these uh, monasteries whether in ladakh or in western tibet is also important because it is the only surviving visual representation of the culture of kashmir of the ancient period as paintings within the kashmir valley itself uh, were destroyed and it is only in these paintings ranging from uh, ladakh till uh, western tibet that we see the the art the architecture the textiles the themes which would have existed in uh, kashmir at that time now this is a green tara you would notice that uh, that exquisite uh, shading that exquisite uh, rendering of form which you see beginning in the paintings of ajanta you would also notice the protruding uh, further eye which is in the medieval tradition of uh, indian art and you would see a profusion of textiles which would remind you that this was on an artery of the silk route which connected asia to europe and this artery came down from uh, from kashmir and ladakh through nalla supara down to kerala in south india you might also notice the uh, figures on the side while the deities are made in the center these uh, figures that are made on the side convey a great sense of liveliness and joy in fact it is the sense of joy which is a very particular quality of the art of uh, kashmir we are reminded that one of the greatest philosophers of aesthetics of the indian tradition abhinav gupt lived in the kashmir valley just before the period of the artists who would have painted this again a detail uh, from the alchi paintings made by the kashmiri painters this is a, a temple to uh, balarama and you would notice that uh, it has a tower to the green tara in it and this is a feature which is uh, uh, this feature of having uh, deities of hinduism and buddhism together is a feature that you see not only here but you see in the caves of uh, china and you see in uh, japan and so many other places you might also notice uh, the musicians in the lower part of the painting again filled with that sense of joy which fills these paintings this is um, a mandala deity in uh, the monastery of uh, nako in kinnor in a very high altitude a part of kinnor again it is the uh, 
Kashmiri painters, again you would see that gentleness and that inward look, that grace, that lilting grace which reminds you that there is an end to the sorrow of the world. Lipakshi, uh, procession of uh, Parvati. Again you see a, profe- uh, a profusion of textiles that reminds you that uh, reminds you of the great uh, trade which was taking place even till that time. This is in the time of the uh, Vijayanagar kingdom in the Deccan. And this is a uh, 16th century, a mural uh, painting at uh, a very rarely seen mural painting uh, of the time of uh, Akbar at uh, Fatehpur Sikri. It is a European woman uh, playing the flute. And here we are reminded that uh, European influences came to Indian art long before the British came. As a matter of fact, uh, in this case, it was uh, uh, Father Rudolf Akwaiva and Father Montserrat from uh, St. Paul's uh, College in uh, Old Goa who were the guests of Emperor Akbar and were staying at uh, Fatehpur Sikri. And they would have carried with them so many painted manuscripts and books which they would have presented uh, to the emperor. Again, 16th century, uh, Vinu Gopala, uh, Lord Krishna playing the flute, uh, a very favoured uh, uh, theme of uh, Indic art. As a matter of fact, uh, Sujata and I have been delighted to find uh, a Vinu Gopala as one of the uh, one of the oldest uh, uh, art pieces in uh, the oldest uh, uh, temple, this temple of Japan at Nara, the great Buddha temple, the Todaiji temple, has this huge uh, brass lamp, which is its uh, which is from its oldest period. And that has made upon it a beautiful uh, Vino Gopala. And interestingly, we have also seen uh, modern posters in uh, Japanese restaurants in Kyoto uh, depicting the Vino Gopala. Vino Gopala continues as a very favorite uh, theme. And uh, the paintings of Kerala, now this is at uh, Mutton Cherry Palace in Kochi. The paintings of Kerala continue the beauty of uh, ancient Indian art well into the medieval period. It is one of the uh, last places which continues this exquisite uh, shading of the human uh, limbs and forms. And you would also notice that uh, tender expression upon the face of uh, the deity. The finest of the art of Rajasthan survives in the Bhojan Shala of the uh, Amir Palace next to uh, Jaipur. And here again, you would see that uh, that uh, fondness that the Indian artist has for animals. In fact, the animals are just beings, just like you and I. And even the word animal does not seem very... Uh, it is an English word and does not seem very suitable when we are speaking about this, this beautiful gajja, this elephant. You would notice the smile on the face of the elephant. You would notice the twinkle in his eye. Chamba in Himachal Pradesh. And this is the, uh, this is, uh, the family of Shiva in the uh, Shiva Dwara temple just outside uh, the city of Chamba. And I may uh, mention that Chamba is one of uh, one of the best places that uh, uh, carries forward, that continues uh, traditions in uh, Himachal Pradesh. Perhaps it is because it is a little uh, cut off from uh, the main uh, uh, development and tourist uh, routes and you do not, uh, till the last time I went there, you do not have so many outsiders uh, visiting there. 
but indeed uh, the traditions are well maintained uh, there. The art of Chamba is beautiful. In fact, it has uh, many, uh, many temples which uh, uh, going back to the 8th century and even the 7th or the 6th century which uh, still preserve marvelous uh, wooden uh, uh, sculpture in their doorways and other places. The art as you see here and as you also see in the uh, wooden sculpture of Chamba, the art is extremely similar to the art of the Kashmir Valley of that period. And obviously the connections between uh, the Kashmir Valley and Chamba in the ancient period were very intimate. Uh, there still exists a walking pathway uh, from the Chamba side uh, to uh, Srinagar. And this is Odisha, a remote uh, tribal part of Odisha called uh, Buguda. And this is the Viranchi Narayan temple and it is a theme from uh, the Ramayana. The oldest and the, the finest, actually, the finest paintings that survive in uh, Goa. These are on the uh, ceiling of the basement of the nunnery of Santa Monica. And uh, men are not really allowed in there. And actually the uh, basement is in a, is in a very bad uh, and ruined condition something which you are not able to make out in this, this close-up uh, photograph taken with my technique of uh, photographing in extremely low light. But uh, uh, it, the, the, the basement is not really in good condition, but these paintings are the best that survive uh, in old Goa. And the spread of this tradition, uh, these are the paintings of uh, Sigiriya, caves in uh, Sri Lanka of the 5th century and all the art historians of uh, Sri Lanka always uh, point out uh, the deep connection which they feel there is between Ajanta and Sigiriya. Indeed, you do see uh, that same grace, you do see that, uh, that deep and inward look uh, that marvelous quality of this art which reminds you of Ajanta. I might mention that my uh, book on uh, the Buddhist heritage of Sri Lanka uh, is expected to be out uh, next month. And this is uh, 6th century. These, uh, this is in the uh, uh, Kizil Caves of Kucha in China. And it is uh, Shiva and Parvati. As I had mentioned before, uh, most uh, Buddhist uh, uh, temples and caves of the early period have the making of uh, many uh, Hindu deities in them. And uh, Kucha is a, is a very special place because it is uh, reminiscent of, uh, of a great uh, son of India who became the most important person in the entire Buddhist tradition of uh, China. Uh, Kumarayana of uh, Kashmir uh, was married to uh, Princess Jiva of uh, Kucha and their son was called uh, Kumara Jiva after both the names. Princess Jiva brought uh, Kumara Jiva to the valley of Kashmir where he stayed for 13 years and studied uh, Sanskrit and Buddhist uh, scriptures. On his return to Kucha, he became very famous as uh, the greatest uh, translator of Buddhist scriptures. In fact, it is said that uh, China attacked and annexed Kucha because of the importance of uh, Kumara Jiva. And this is uh, Myanmar. It is uh, a painting of the 12th century from uh, Bagan, birth of the Buddha. The uh, art historians of uh, Myanmar are very enthusiastic about Indian art and they uh, feel that their paintings are deeply connected to the tradition which emanates from the paintings of Ajanta. 
And uh, the earliest uh, paintings which survive in uh, Tibet are in the Dunkar Caves, in an extremely remote part of uh, Western Tibet, way beyond uh, uh, Manasarovar. And uh, uh, the uh, historians of uh, uh, Tibet often feel that uh, these paintings are made by the Kashmiri artists. But uh, I personally feel that these are made by uh, people who are trained under the Kashmiri artists because the, uh, the form is certainly there. But the exquisite quality and the subtlety, the subtlety of the art is not fully there. Therefore, I think it is uh, people who have trained under the Kashmiri artists. And with this, we come to the last of the pictures I had for you today. I'll be very happy to answer questions. Thank you very much. Lights, please.